Yeah, hi Matt, uh, Neil Young here, uh, Managing Director of ASX Listed Elixir Energy. It's a pleasure to be joining you again. I could see it. Um, we had a good chat, or rather you had a good chat with Merlin, a um, uh, rather technical one in May, kind of la- laid out um, you know, what the, what the team are trying to do. Um, I want to come at it from a slightly simpler perspective today. I'm looking at a sub $100 million company with a portfolio approach, you've got, you've got obviously the grandest project in Queensland, you've got your hydrogen green energy project and your you know, um, gas project or COVID methane project in Mongolia. People, people may be a little confused as to how does a small company manage a portfolio? You know, should it be offloading something? How do you monetize something? You know, what do you need to do to survive? I mean, good question, Matt. And I think it goes to the heart of what we recognize as being our competitive advantage. And that is that we can get into things before big companies can. We obviously took quite a number of years in Mongolia to negotiate the country's first uh, COVID methane production sharing contract. Uh, In Queensland, we moved very quickly after the war, which in our view reset uh, global appetites for risk in terms of securing gas from from LNG markets to Australia's favour. And we've we've developed both of those projects uh, now to the point of, of, of drilling in Queensland imminently. But what we also recognize is, in effect, know your limits. And small companies can uh, find things quickly, they can explore, they can appraise. If they try and leap to be producers, that often fails. So our view is that, that we don't love any of our assets. We, we recognize that all of them will pass on to other owners if they're successful, which is a great outcome. With the hydrogen project, we're already working with a very large partner. We would see similar things happening or indeed ultimate ownership of assets passing on as, as we add value. So that, that I think is the key to our, how we manage the portfolio and how we take it forward. Right. So that's the mentality. Um, I want to deal with the here and now because obviously it's in the backdrop of a market which is very difficult for mm-hmm. equities, broadly speaking. Uh, you're in the lucky position. You've got 10, 11 million bucks worth of cash. You've got optionality in terms of how quickly you spend that and where, where you spend that. Right. Um, so. I'm trying to work out where the value should be attributed at the moment because you, you know you, Richard was on the show in uh, in May uh, along with you guys, where you, you talked about his success in taking a company which was you know falling over and then six years later selling it for an amount of six billion dollars. There must be learnings from that. Um, there's also a bit of credibility from that because it was you know the Queensland gas company where your your asset is in, is in Queensland. So. Do you think the market's giving you more credit or is there more expectation on that asset than Mongolia? I, I think the, the market's on the cusp between the two. And I'll, and I'll go down a side route first. I think, firstly, the hydrogen asset, although it's got a great partner, is probably uh, not fully valued by our current shareholders who are focused naturally on, on natural gas. Um, but value there could be uh, delivered in due course by, for instance, spinning it out to a separate list co, which could attract hydrogen-focused uh, investors. And that's something that we're, we're actively considering, but, but not committed to at this point. So going back uh, to, to the, the primary gas assets, I think activity will drive share price action. And, and obviously having now locked in a rig in a time slot for Grandis, we expect a lot of focus to go on to that. And then after we spud and then get to tr- total depth and then stimulate the well and get, get flows, then clearly that will also drive activity. But uh, uh, news flow ultimately can only deliver true value for the longer term if it's reporting you know, positive results. And we think we've, we've picked up here a very low risk play in terms of having a drilling and appraisal well in a location which to circle back to my earlier point, is advantage now from a global gas market perspective. Uh, that's, that's obviously not to, to downright Mongolia, but if the Queensland well works, um, and I said in our recent uh, announcement, it's the most impactful well the company's ever drilled, and it's nearly 20 years of being listed. And I think that that will, will drive value thereafter. But clearly, Mongolia still got lots of potential too. Right, but, but let, let's look at the kind of ec- economics or the economic environment for this. Obviously, you know, Russia Ukraine situations sort will of drove gas prices up across Europe, and I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, changing attitudes to you know where energy supply um, came from in Queensland. Um, how are prices? What kind of environment are you kind of building into or drilling into compared to say? A year ago, is, is it still um, as, as, as prevalent and as important a, a, an area to be 
uh, focused on, or, you know, quite frankly, is, is Mongolia a little bit more exciting in terms of the pricing environment? What, what, what do you think? So, so a year ago, gas prices were, were to use a technical term, insane. Um, they, the the <laughs> outcome of the, of the war had uh, driven them to you know, much higher than equivalent oil prices in the spot market locations in, in Europe and Japan. Um, it was only really in America they, they stayed low. I mean, even domestic spot prices in Australia just went, went off the scale. Um, but, but things have retreated back to a degree of normality um, uh, since then. Gas prices inside Australia are still you know, fairly rich. And uh, you know, in our location, we can access international LNG prices too. Um, the, unfortunately, the insanity that I just mentioned led the Australian government to try and intervene in gas markets. Uh, they announced a policy just before Christmas, which uh, um, tried to um, uh, su uh, suppress gas prices. Uh, but actually, just today, the government's released the final uh, code of conduct outcome uh, from that gas market intervention. And, and to be honest, it, it, it's a lot of sand and fury that signifies nothing. Basically, there's so many exemptions and carve outs, it doesn't affect us and pretty much doesn't affect anybody else. Um, so somewhat annoying, but hey, that's that's governments for you. <laughs> Let's not go down that track. Uh, we've got our own problems over here as well. Um, okay, so it, again, just looking at the Queensland market, and so and I appreciate what Rich has done before, and I, I'm, I'm, I keep kind of harking back to that because there'll be the lessons learned, and I guess expectations have been set as, as a result of that. The Queensland kind of in, infrastructure um, for for gas. I mean. What are you kind of feeding into? Because I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit understand the kind of commerciality of what you're, what you're trying to do. I get, I get you've you've got a drill, which is fantastic. You're going to start the kind of whole spotting process. And in fact, how long that, how long does that kind of process take to actually kind of get um, results back so we actually understand what this looks like? Yeah, so so the, the well will take around thirty to forty five days to to get to total depth after spotting. And then uh, we will need to analyze the results of that and optimize a stimulation program, which will follow early in the new year. And then that, that will take a month or so, and then we'll get flows at, at the end of that period. So there'll be uh, you know, some news coming through as we pass various milestones uh, through that, uh, through that, that period of, of around six months. Right. Okay. And because again, 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 I'm just if I'm looking at the market and the kind of feedback and the sort of analysis of you know how people have looked into your project. If we saw, if we saw what happened in Mongolia, um, I think people are slightly disappointed by the the, the decline rates in the, the in the field there. And it, and it is a case of managing the field and you know working out where you put your drills and how you how the data is created and what you then do with that data. With Queensland, you're talking about one hole. It's going to take a while to kind of get down to the depths that you're looking at. How do you manage the field and therefore how do you manage expectations in the marketplace? So going to, going to the point about risk, this is an appraisal well. A BG Group, now Shell, drilled here and spent you know, a few hundred million dollars uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, most of the data from that program became public, as, as is the case in countries like Australia. And we used that data, given its immediate proximity to our permits, to actually book a contingent resource, i.e. discovered gas accumulation, or 400 billion cubic feet, which, which is pretty significant. Um, but that booking was based only on certain parts of the Permian era formation, i.e. tight sandstones. And uh, our stimulation program will also target deep coals. And our view is that we can very substantially increase that contingent resource from this well. To go back to your earlier point about infrastructure, the assets located about 50 clicks from what's called the Wallambilla hub, which is both a physical and a, and a, a market-based trading hub, which connects um, this asset potentially to markets across Queensland, also to, to Australia's southeastern states of Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia. And also there are a number of pipelines going uh, northeast to the LNG plants in the port of Gladstone, which can currently supply East Asian markets, but which have declining uh, resources of their own from their, from their uh, foundation assets. So there's a wealth of optionality here to target um, domestic markets and international markets you know, across Australia and, 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 of course, East Asia on, on the latter part. Right. And you mentioned, obviously, the Australian government getting involved like they, like they tend to do um, on, on, on anything topical, um, where 
the LNG component versus the domestic use component, uh, you, you talked about some, some of the initiatives which, which the government is trying to kind of ram through. You say it hasn't affected companies and won't it, uh, impact companies negatively. Can it impact you positively in terms of, is there a kind of bifurcation in terms of the pricing um, for domestic use or, um, or credits or tax incentives or, or, or other for you? versus the kind of export model? Uh, so on, on, on the tax credit side, we have um, secured a binding ruling from the Australian federal government that um, the Daydream 2 well and, and all its activities will qualify for R&D tax credits, which in the Australian context means the government you know, physically pays us for about half the cost of the well, which uh, is, is clearly something you know, highly attractive to us. Um, so uh, uh, in... In, in, in addition, the, the intervention in the market, in effect, put a, a six month hold on investment in supply sources. And, uh, my uh, economics says when you, when you uh, impact supply and uh, demand still the same, then the price goes up. So the, the, there might be an actually uh, bad for the government, good for us outcome from their intervention in, into the, the market of the last six months. Interesting. This is the, this 43 and a half percent that, um, R&D tax incentive, I think you mentioned last time. Uh, uh, okay, in interesting. Um, <clears throat> okay, and um, so t timing, we understand. Will you consider any other kind of, because it's expensive drilling, right? What are we talking about? It's mm -hmm. deep, so you know, what, what is it per hole? Um, we haven't disclosed that to the market, so mm -hmm. which is sort of typical practice on the ASX. So I'll probably still be somewhat coy about that, but it will be considerably more than the shallow wells we drill in Mongolia. Um, right, okay. So... I, I guess, and so you're going to have to, um, we're talking about six months out, but you're going to have to kind of try and understand the data. And when you do, you make some decisions mm -hmm. about where you can focus your efforts. You, like I mentioned earlier, you've got 10, 11 million bucks. You're going to need a bunch more money uh, to come. You're going to wait till the end of this drill program before you obviously work out what the reaction in the market has been, and therefore, if you can you raise sort of cheaper money further down the line. What's your expectation um, of the kind of market uh, reaction to this in uh, so I mean it, Queensland energy deficit or energy positive at the moment I, I can never kind of quite keep up. So so Queensland's pretty positive, but some of its states to the south are not so much, and and they import right. quite a bit of okay. gas from Queensland, and uh, they're increasingly calling on that as 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 their indigenous supplies and, in, for instance, Victoria start to decline significantly. But Queensland itself ha has, you know, surpluses which why exports through LNG as well as two domestic markets. I mean, to, to go back to your funding point, um, we've secured this uh, in a grant uh, process from the government, but we are working on a number of other options to provide funding as well from from various sources. Obviously, until they close, we can't we can't you know announce them or rely upon them. But there are quite a few things which, uh, you know, knock on wood, we would like to be announcing over the months to come, which will indicate that there are, uh, in effect, non-equity sources of funding in addition to the government side. Right. So there's the kind of head code versus asset level side of thing. And, and obviously, are you, there's, there'll be, there will be gas flowing. Presumably, at that point, you're, you're selling gas into the market, not in great quantities, I know, but... It will help, presumably. So, so the initial flows from from this appraisal will um, you know, would be probably hard to capture into the market because the infrastructure is still a number of you know tens of kilometres away. But there are things that you know we would be and do look at. Now, for instance, can you find a, a Bitcoin guy who will go and use gas to go and you know sell some fraudulent coins to people or, or whatever their business model is? Excuse me. <laughs> um, and uh, there there are other things like that that we we would contemplate. Right. So. You can yeah, so we did we did something similar in Poland, and I was just wondering because it was allowed, mm. you know, at least you know it covers a bit of GNA. It's all, it's all kind of good, good stuff. Um, okay, well, I, I guess we will wait and see um, uh, these announcements from you as you kind of move through that that, that process and see you know what your decision making is off the back of that. Um, let's should we just um, trot up to Mongolia if, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. um, where clearly. The, the Chinese market is, is very hungry for, for, for energy um, of, well, of, of any kind, quite frankly. So how are, you kind of, how are you allocating your time and money in terms of the gas project versus the hydrogen project? Because uh, there's different perceptions in the marketplace about uh, you know, how, how quick the hydrogen will actually be able to flow where, when hydrogen will be able to be commercialized versus a kind of, I guess, gas 
known entity, um, known infrastructure. We know where we're going with that. So how are you viewing Mongolia at the moment? It's interesting in that um, the, the hydrogen is clearly longer dated, as, as, as you're saying. But the appetite of third-party financiers is incredibly strong for that. So about a month ago, I, I was invited by the Asian Development Bank to go to an annual conference they host in their headquarters in Manila to present on, on the hydrogen project. And uh, international financial institutions like the ADB and, and others are very, very keen to support these sorts of ventures, particularly in developing nations like Mongolia, where they have a big presence and a big role to play. So we see third party finance for that project as being eminently procurable from those sources. And in addition to the ADB, you know, we were talking about three or four other similar entities too. And of course, the Japanese partner that we have is, is uh, uh, somewhat larger than us as Toyota Sushu, a member of the Toyota group, uh, clearly not uh, short of a dollar or a yen to, to help out on these things too. But in addition to that, I was uh, invited to Beijing after Manila. The Chinese interest in energy sources of all types from Mongolia is rising. I mean, gas is clearly immediate and, and, and will have an enduring role uh, you know, throughout the medium term. But there is growing interest in China to the incredible renewable resource potential of Mongolia, which can be delivered to its markets through, through, through the mechanism of hydrogen. And uh, uh, that's a really fascinating area and, and, and uh, you know, one that, that we are, again, the first mover on and uh, uh, one that uh, you know, we, we see as being of, of considerable merit to the company, in addition to the shorter term imperatives of, of the Queensland project that we've been discussing earlier. Right. OK. And, but again, with, with, with the um, non, take, so let's just take the non-gone project first. If mm -hmm. we take, it's, it's a big land package. Uh, it will require lots and lots of money. Um, and yeah, if you're not getting credit for it now, have you kind of slowed down your efforts there? Are you looking for, you know, additional partners to kind of help you with this? I'm, I'm just trying to add, how do you manage money in an environment like this? Because you either sit back and do nothing or you try to advance it in some way, shape or form. So that we would never be the, the primary developer of the CBM asset in, in Mongolia. We're, we're the explorer and the appraiser. And this year, we've slightly reduced the number of wells that we're drilling compared to last year in order to allocate capital in, a, in an optimal manner across our portfolio, but also critically to give us time to fully evaluate the pilot project, which we kicked off late last year, which flow gas early and then gas rates went down. And now we're, now we're, we're doing new things to try and get those rates back up. And as our directors noted in, in their interview with your colleague a few months ago, that's entirely normal in CBM pilots. You know, these things can, can go up and down, be fiddled with, uh, you know, for some considerable period. And, uh, as an example, that what's called the Fairview field in Queensland, which is easily one of the best fields in the state. Um, it flowed water for, for a number of years before it got any gas coming through. Um, so every field is different. Coals are, not homogenous and uh, but what we have here are thick coals with proven gas in them and we're just fiddling with nature's uh, knobs if i can call them that to to turn this well up and that one down and get this water level up and that one down add another well and uh, all those things can be done in oil and gas terms at relatively moderate cost but but over time and uh, now we're still we're still very bullish about the, the pilot delivering. And uh, then as and when it does, then we have a, a considerably stronger platform to then engage with the potential longer term partners and developers that will be needed uh, to take the asset to, 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 to full on production. So you seem quite confident about the kind of sum of the parts at, at, at the moment in, mm -hmm. in the sense that you, you understand the value e in their own kind of um, silo, their own, their own vertical space that they're operating in. I'm intrigued by the hydrogen thing. We, we saw something, we've seen something sim similar. In fact, we, we were talking to someone at, at Toyota in terms of the fact that they're not jumping immediately on the, the EV bandwagon and they're, they're looking at hydrogen as, a, again, it, it's one of the solutions they're looking at solid state batteries. They're, they're trying to work out, you know, where the automotive component um, goes to. That's, so it's kind of interesting that they are, um, not throwing the money around. They're looking at all the, all the, all the options. Um, have you, with regards to some of these conferences that you've been to, are you seeing, is that sort of, a, a, sort of across the board, the kind of 
the kind of debt component or the um, state, federal, um, provincial funding type uh, incentives are there for, for all companies with kind of alternative uh, energy solutions? Is, is, that a, is that a thing? I think one of the interesting things I'm observing at these uh, conferences is that as people do work on hydrogen, they realize it's hard. And a lot of projects have, in effect, what I call field of dreams, um, you know, business plans, I build it and they will come. But our, our, our hydrogen project has always been grounded in the reality that hydrogen is expensive to move and uh, therefore locate a project next door to the market. And China is expected to to produce a lot of hydrogen internally, and it's a, it's a global leader in doing that, but also to have an extended demand that will need substantial um, imports, and this is a great location for that. So uh, hydrogen has been, even in, in a two or three year period that we've been on this, on a journey, which which, and that journey just illustrates that the laws of physics mean that hydrogen is tough. So unless you've got a key competitive advantage, um, you, you're going to struggle. But we, we believe that we have, and that's the location. Um, and uh, we think our strategy has been vindicated the more we hear uh, of these other projects at, at these conferences. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'd love to talk to you more, more about that one because it's obviously fairly, fairly nascent. But as you say, the kind of commerciality component is sometimes lost on some of the companies talking talking a good game without actually looking at the end point. Um, so, Neil, it, what would, what would you say to kind of shareholders who perhaps you know looking at the, looking at the share chart, you, you and everyone else? Whereas it's we're we're obviously clearly in a dip at the moment. Do you think that in terms of your model, you're you're capable of either unlocking the value? I talk about this kind of some of the parts um, a component in terms of that optionality, the cash optionality, and when the market comes back. So there's a lot, a lot of moving parts there in terms of run, run the kind of economics of uh, chance of success uh, here for you. Um, how, how are you kind of viewing the market and how you play this? Or because you've got the cash, you, it, I guess in a meaningful way, you don't really kind of care at this, this moment in time. So, yeah, the, the market is has clearly been tough for a number of months, and particularly compared to the absolute raging bull market that uh, that we saw through through COVID. But uh, uh, interest rates going from an effect zero to, to 5% impacted on allocations of capital between uh, growth companies such as ours and uh, and more sort of staid uh, uh, investment opportunities available to people. But I think that the reality, particularly for commodity businesses like ours, is that as the world grows, it needs uh, it needs energy, it needs metals, and the balance of demand for those metals and, and forms of energy is weighted away from some things and towards other things. And we're obviously positioned ourselves to be at the end of the spectrum where money is going to go because demand will increase for you know, the cleaner forms of energy that we're pursuing in both countries and also in the sense of, of, of Queensland, you know, security of supply becomes a factor of two in, in, in energy commodities. And, and Australia provides that. And conversely, if you're Chinese, Mongolia provides that. You know, Mongolia is a safer form of energy provision than, for instance, you know, your, your buddies that you don't quite trust are sitting in the Kremlin. Um, and uh, that that's always been a competitive advantage of the assets there. Now, we recognize, of course, that we're Australian, but uh, uh, we would see that, that the due passage of ownership of assets over time will uh, will, will, will end up in a fashion that, that you know, suits everyone. Um, I'm sure you can see what I mean by that. I can. Okay. Well, like, uh, Neil, I appreciate the update and, and keeping us up to date mm -hmm. with what's been going on and, and clearly re-emphasizing re the strategy. Um, very keen to see what happens with Grandis Project in, in, in Queensland, obviously, um, because I think, you know, things can be a bit slow, slow moving sometimes. So I guess having a portfolio approach does help in terms of that news flow. So stay in touch. Let us know how you get on. Okay. Will do. And, and thanks for your time as, as always, mate.